Good morning. Good morning. Better. Okay. You don't have to have another cup of coffee. Welcome to Open, She Opened the Door 2020. I'm Francine Glick, uh, Barnard Class of 77. And I'm one of the She Opened the Door uh, Task Force Chairs, along with Anna Rodriguez, who you will hear from, there she is, this afternoon. Um, we're so excited that you've been able to join us here today. We're pleased to be continuing the tradition we established with the first She Opened the Door event in 2018, and are excited that this year's event falls on the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. We have over 600 alumni registered for this event uh, from many of the Columbia schools, and we have over 100 Columbia students. We also have about 400 who are streaming this online. When we planned this event, we wanted to accomplish three goals. Educate, we're at a university, so that makes sense. Um, help you connect with each other and with the university, and how wonderful is it to be back on campus. And finally, to celebrate. Uh, one of the things women do is that they work really hard, but they forget to celebrate their successes. So today is a celebration. Now, before we start a little bit of housekeeping, um, you should download the app if you haven't already, which will help you uh, to get the most out of today's event. If you go to your apps, you can download uh, Attendee Hub, and it's under Crown, uh, Crowd Compass. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can speak to a staff member by the app instructional sign in the North Lobby for assistance. So the app includes maps of Learner Hall for room locations, your personal schedule, it's really cool, it tells you where to go, um, an opportunity to connect with fellow alumni using the chat feature, and full bios of all of the speakers. Now please bring your name badge wherever you go to show that you're registered. It's your ticket. Uh, visit the registration table if you have any questions. Now today we're gonna have three breakout sessions in the morning and three in the afternoon. So the breakout sessions will take place either in the cinema, which is on the second floor, room 555, which is on the fifth floor, and room B60, which was formerly known as the party space on the lower level. The hashtag for today's event is hashtag she opened the door. Use it freely on social media. We encourage you to share photos and takeaways from the event on social. If you use the hashtag, you may even see your picture on the big screen at the closing celebration. All right, enough housekeeping. So this year, for the first time, you have a chance to honor someone who opened the door for you, personally or professionally, by making a gift in their name to a Columbia school, program, or cause that matters to you. You can learn more about this exciting Who Opened the Door for You fundraising initiative at the table in North Lobby, as well as at openthedoor.columbia.edu. More information can also be found on that wonderful app. Now, when we were planning this event, we wanted to give everyone a historical base from where to start. And who else to help us do that but Erica Kitzmiller. Erica is a professor of education at Barnard College, where she teaches courses on inequality education and public policy. Her scholarship focuses on historical and contemporary policies and practices that contribute to inequality today. This morning, she will share a fascinating look at women's history over the past 100 years. It's my pleasure to welcome Erica. Where is she? There you are. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Good morning. I first want to thank the She Opened the Door program organizing committee, especially Linda Ari Greenberg, for inviting me to speak to you today. But more importantly, I want to thank them for assembling such a diverse and engaging group of Columbia alumni and current students. It is such a gift to have time for us to come together to reflect, connect, and develop, and I'm honored to be here with you this morning. 
As a historian of inequality and in education, the committee invited me to speak about the history of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, an amendment introduced in 1919 and ratified 100 years ago in 1920. It is a story that involves women like the suffragettes from San Francisco and New Jersey in this photograph from diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and places. And it is a project that I will argue remains unfinished still today. On May 21, 1919, U.S. Representative James R. Mann, an Illinois Republican and Suffrage Committee Chairman, proposed a resolution shown here in this photograph stating that, quote, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The resolution passed the House later that afternoon, but took another year for the states to officially ratify it. On November 2nd, 1920, more than 8 million American women cast their ballots, many for the first time. It was the single biggest expansion of the franchise in the nation's history. The two women most closely associated with the campaign for women's suffrage, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, never had the opportunity to see this moment come to fruition. Cady Stanton died in 1902. Anthony, her personal and political partner for more than 50 years, died four years later in 1906. When we refer to the 19th Amendment as giving the women the right to vote, we miss several things. First, by centering the story of women's suffrage around the 19th Amendment, we forget that thousands of women voted before the passage of this important milestone. As some of you may already know, states controlled and still control who can and cannot vote in general elections. New Jersey's first constitution, passed in 1776, gave voting rights to, quote, all inhabitants of this colony of full age who are worth 50 pounds and have resided within the county for 12 months. In, 19, in 1790, state legislators added the words, quote, every voter shall openly and in full view deliver his or her ballot to clarify that both men and women could vote. In 1807, New Jersey legislators changed the Constitution and formally restricted voting to white male citizens. Moreover, even though most of the formal organized activities that make our way into our high school textbooks took place in the East, women in the West were actually the first ones to once again earn the right to exercise the franchise in the 19th century. In 1869, Wyoming legislators approved an amendment shown here in this photograph that gave women access to the ballot and the right to hold public office. On September 6, 1869, Esther Hobart Morris became the first woman to hold public office in the United States. On February 17, 1870, Morris was appointed as a Justice of the Peace in South Pass City, Wyoming. Being the first woman, even in sparsely populated Wyoming, mattered. However, women's rights did not necessarily motivate these changes. William Bright, the lawmaker who introduced Wyoming's first female suffrage bill, advocated for women's suffrage to counter the newfound freedom and power that black men finally enjoyed under the 15th Amendment. Other legislators supported the bill to attract women to provide the territory's majority male population with newcomers who might ultimately become their future wives. In 1900, three states, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, had already passed legislation that gave women the right to vote. By 1918, most of the Western states had already passed legislation that made it possible for some, but not all women, to vote. The racism that plagued the expansion of the franchise in the West tainted the women's suffrage movement from the onset. White suffrage leaders, including Anthony and Stanton, publicly opposed the passage of the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. The suffragists argued that white women should come first. When suffragists marched in Washington, D.C., white suffrage leaders insisted on two groups. White women marched in the front of the parade, and black women, shown here in this photograph, marched in the back of the parade. These women included noted journalist Ida B. Wells. White women, like those in this photograph, vocally opposed suffrage because they opposed giving black women the right to vote. Even after the passage of the 19th Amendment, many women were still barred from voting. The 19th Amendment did not confer the right to vote. It simply says that you cannot be barred on the basis of sex. This is a very important distinction. It was still perfectly constitutional to retain measures to limit access to the ballot. Literacy tests and polling taxes, like the one shown in this photograph, barred thousands of black men and women from voting, even though they had citizenship. Black women appealed to white suffragists to help them fight for their constitutional right, 
but white suffragists often refused to support them. In an era of massive voter suppression, one could easily argue that black Americans are still fighting for their voting rights today. Citizenship regulations also determine who is eligible to vote. Native Americans did not receive the right to vote until the federal government granted them full citizenship rights in 1947. In 1952, Asian Americans were brought into citizenship and voting. And of course, the Civil Rights Act expanded voting protections, particularly for African Americans. Beyond these critical dates, women of diverse racial, ethnic, and religious backgrounds urged suffrage leaders to expand the concerns that they had about women's rights beyond the ballot box. They did so because many of these women were not eligible to vote when the 19th Amendment passed, or because they viewed the ballot as one of simply many tools for social justice. While bourgeoisie suffragettes campaigned for women's suffrage, thousands of American women secured positions where they worked long hours, sometimes more than 16 hours a day, in poorly ventilated, dim coal factories. If any of the workers complained, the foreman reminded them that there was always another person, usually an immigrant who had just arrived from Europe, desperate for a job, waiting to take their place. Women and children made up the majority of workers in the garment industry. Spurred by their own experiences in the factory and the political convictions of equity that had brought them to America, women led the charge for change. Standing less than four feet nine inches tall with blazing red hair, Rose Schneiderman, a Polish Jim Jewish immigrant, entered the workforce as a lining stitcher in a cap factory located near her family's home on the Lower East Side here in New York City. Frustrated with her working conditions, she began organizing the women in her factory and gained wide recognition for her work in the 1905 citywide cap maker strike. She eventually became involved with the New York Women's Trade Union League, shown here in this photograph, which was an organization that lent moral and financial support to the organizing efforts of women workers. Schneiderman became the vice president of the League's New York branch in 1908, and with the support of a wealthy supporter, left the factory to organize workers full time. Schneiderman is perhaps best known for her remark that, quote, the woman needs bread, but she needs roses too. For her, workers needed basic human rights to sustain themselves, such as bread, but they also needed roses, things like good schools, access to recreation, and professional networks for women to advance themselves economically, politically, and socially. Like Schneiderman, Clara Lemlech found work in a garment factory on the Lower East Side. Angered by the working conditions and the long hours, Lemlech began organizing her fellow workers under the auspices of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Even though many of the male leaders in the union resented Lemlech's presence, she persevered and reminded them that the success of their union depended on women's membership, since women made up the increasing number of workers in the city. On November 22, 1909, Clara Lemlech addressed a crowd of thousands of frustrated workers in New York City's Cooper Union. In her native Yiddish, Lemlech told the crowd, quote, I am one of those who suffers from the abuses described here, and I move that we go on a general strike. Her actions sparked the uprising of 20,000, a critical point in American labor activism. The uprising of 20,000, described here in this New York Times article, started with a series of spontaneous strikes against the Lyserson Company, the Rosen Company, and the infamous Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Even though the motivations behind the strikes differed, workers were committed to securing better wages, fewer hours, and improved workplace safety. Many of them also spoke about the indignities that women experienced in the workplace, primarily sexual harassment and assault, challenges that still remain with us today. When Schneiderman and Lemlech fought to preserve dignity and security for working women, others dedicated their lives to improving outcomes for others. Born in Boston on April 10, 1880, Frances Perkin used her education, including a master's degree in political science from Columbia, to advance protections from the nation's most vulnerable. As an official in New York State government, Perkins led the campaign to increase the minimum wage, introduce unemployment benefits, and reduce working hours for female laborers. Perkins served as the first woman to hold a cabinet position in the federal government and used her influence as FDR's Secretary of Labor to build his, his New Deal agenda. Trained as a photographer at Columbia University, Dorothea Lange used her camera to document the challenges associated with poverty during the Great Depression. Perhaps her most famous photograph, Migrant Mother, shown here, which still hangs in the Library of Congress. Years later, the U.S. War Relocation Authority hired Dorothea Lang to document the relocation of Japanese Americans during World War II. Even though she vehemently opposed these policies and processes, Lang accepted the position, and because of her work, 
we have thousands of photographs, like the one shown in this slide, documenting these atrocities and injustices. While women of color had always used their voices to challenge injustice, in the 1960s and 1970s, they organized to end voter suppression, particularly in the South. Ella Baker played a critical, if often overlooked, and I would say overshadowed role in black civil rights organizations, including the NAACP and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She was committed to economic justice for all people and once said, quote, people cannot be free until there's enough work in this land to give everyone a job, end quote. Building on the work of Ella Baker and other civil rights activists, women continued their fight for equality. Women have always worked, and they have always worked for lower wages. In 1961, the Kennedy administration appointed labor activist Esther Peterson, shown here in this photograph, to lead the Women's Bureau in the Department of Labor. This bureau was responsible for administering gender issue labor laws. Esther convinced Kennedy to establish a presidential commission on the status of women to develop recommendations for achieving equality. She gathered data, built coalitions, and won over opponents in a successful campaign to bring an Equal Pay Act before Congress. In February 1963, Esther Peterson submitted a draft of an Equal Pay Act to Congress on behalf of the Kennedy administration. After a long and contentious debate, the House and Senate passed a watered-down version of the bill on June 10, 1963. According to President Kennedy, the Equal Pay Act of 1963 was only, quote, a first step, and much remains to be done to achieve full equality of economic opportunity, end quote. Women understood this. We still do. Women and their allies took to the streets to protest unequal pay, limited growth, and the burden of care inside the home. Polly Murray worked with Peterson on the Presidential Commission and then with future Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on several cases to dis end discrimination based on sex. Black power activists, like those shown in this photograph, advanced women's causes and introduced the school breakfast program, which now receives federal support. LGBTQ activists, such as Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, shown in this slide, and disability activists, including those in this photograph, wrote petitions, staged protests, and conducted sit-ins to fight for recognition and visibility in the public sphere and for rights under the law. Our lives rest on the legacy of what these individuals have done. We have indeed inherited a better world because of their work. And yet we all know that there is still much work to be done 100 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment. In the past few years, we have witnessed a movement to limit suffrage, particularly among people of color in the United States. In 2000, a federal court ruled that citizens in U.S. territories, including those in Puerto Rico, cannot vote. And in 2013, Shelby County v. Holder gutted voting protections from the 19th Civil Rights Act, which many has argued has made it more difficult for voters of color to vote in this country. At the same time, we have seen a proliferation of movements led by women of all ages and backgrounds to end voter suppression, sexual assault and harassment in the workplace, to end police violence, to address the global climate crisis. We have seen women run for office in unprecedented numbers and win. This all matters. And as you sit here listening and learning from the speakers, panels, and most importantly from one another, I'd urge you to use this time to consider what you might do to advance economic equity and justice for women globally. We are right to celebrate the gains that women around the globe have fought for and won, but we still need to think about the work that remains to be done and what part we can play in that struggle as we continue to fight for a more just and equitable world. Thank you. I now have the honor of introducing Nobel laureate Lima Bowie, our first keynote speaker. Lima is a Liberian peace activist, social worker, and women's rights advocate. She is the executive director of the Women, Peace, and Security Program here at Columbia's Earth Institute and the founder and president of the Bowie Peace Foundation Africa. She was named as one of the top 100 most influential people in gender policy by Apolitical and one of the world's 50 greatest leaders by Fortune. She has far too many accomplishments to mention here, and you may read her full bio in the conference app. So please now join me in welcoming Nobel laureate Lima Bowie. Thank you. Thank you. 
I often say as an African, it's only in the US that you wake up at 7 a.m. and see people alert for a conference. <laughs> like from the New York Women's Foundation breakfast to this meeting and many others. And then as an African, you're expected to arrive and be coherent. But let me just warn you all, I celebrated my 48th birthday last Saturday, and I decided that my birthday celebration will last for the entire month of February. <laughs> and so yesterday, I had something I called a food festival in my tiny apartment here in New York, and there were Africans who came from like eight in the morning, I refused to go home. <laughs> so I'm actually sleep deprived, and I'm just warning you all. Well, it's truly an honor to be here today um, to share my thoughts on your conference, which I think is fantastic. She opened the door. Um, Michaela, my co-director, associate director of the Columbia Women, I mean our Women, Peace and Security program at the Earth Institute is here. I'm also here with the last of my, one of my, the last of my five daughters, and she's number seven of the eight children. So I'm very happy to be here. Sometimes when you have that last person, you can harass them to waking up with you. And then because I have to be on a flight, I thought we should do this this morning, spend some time together because I leave by six to South Africa to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Mandela's release from prison. So down to the business why you invited me. I grew up in a community in Liberia where um, my grandmother, who is still alive at 113, <laughs> was one of the few traditional birth attendants. She had a friend who was a Muslim and she was Christian, and we grew up observing these two women solve problems. They were, can you hear me? Can we, okay, they were, perpetually going around. People will come and call them every morning. Someone is having a baby or some child is sick. They did not go to any formal school, but they were the problem solvers in the community. And we grew up watching that. My mother had the good fortune of not having a son of five daughters. Um, <laughs> and so the five of us were taken care of by our grandmother and then we watch our mother, as we grow up, take on the same kind of community relationship, taking care of everyone. But by that time, we, had, we used to be very, uh, people here would say disrespectful, but we say that was our way of taunting her. We say, Mom, you melt like butter all over other people's problem. It's because she was everywhere trying to solve everything. And then as I grew up and my siblings grew up, we realized that this is not just anyone melting like butter, but if you grew up with a sense of community, there is no way you sit and allow problems to happen without jumping in. So we are the kind of people who have this, in this world, the social dysfunction of running to help women with their babies. You know, do we have any of those kind of women in this room this morning? You know. Or we are the one when children are misbehaving on the train. You're looking at their mom and looking at them and looking at their mom and looking at them and looking at their mom and looking at them and you're like, we should do something here. Even though you don't know that child. So when we grew up, we started with this whole thing, doing the same thing. My mom would see people come to my house and then one day she said to me, you melt like butter. I say, yes, I know. I think I inherited it from you. But if you look at the generation of women, um, especially from where I come in Africa, this is our life. This is our way of life. And it's not just limited to the social sphere. It's limited to um, the politics and different things. 
One of the stories that we don't get people to talk about a lot is the story of the Abba women's riot in Nigeria in the 1920s. These were a group of women who didn't have Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, who decided they were going to resist the British government imposition of taxes on them. And these women came together and dismantled a structure of suppression. A lot of people don't know it, but, but these are the kinds of stories of coming together, of, of opening doors, or doing fantastic work. In the early 1990s, at the border between Kenya and Somalia, there was all these wars and castle, cattle rustling happening. A group of women came together in this place called Wajir and started a peace committee. This is like a predominantly Muslim community. And the women got up and said, it's time, they're calling their elders, calling their husbands and say, it's time for us to do something about the war that has engulfed our community. And the leader of this group unfortunately lost her life a few years ago, Deka Abdi, was the person, she was a school teacher, who was bringing all of these leaders together and saying, we have to do something. In Somalia, in the late 90s and early 2000s, when they went to their peace process, the women showed up and they said, well, the way we are doing this peace process is that if you're not from a clan, you can't participate. Of course, when you're talking about clients, the clients are predominantly ruled by men. So technically, the women had no voice. A group of women went outside, came together from different groups, and came back to the facilitator of the peace talks and said, we have the sixth client. And the sixth client is the client of the women. No one could oppose that. So they became like a huge movement in those years those women came together and sat at the table for the peace talk as the sixth clan. In Liberia, we came together after 14 years of civil war, saying we are tired, we've had enough. We have 10 US dollars from one person purse. We launched a movement that would contribute to the end of a civil war that took almost 10% of our population that took, made one million people internally displaced and 500,000 people refugee. The impact of the war on the infrastructure of Liberia is still prominent today if you went to our country. Our healthcare system is in shambles. Education has been called a mess, a challenge, and every other thing by every leader that has been in office since the end of the war. But the women came together and decided we would do this. The question you want to ask yourself, what was the category of women who came together because you know you always get that people tend to think that it is the educated women who would often step into the space well it was women from every sphere of life christian muslim market women educated women everyone coming together but one feature of our coming together was that we all had gone through some kind of pain some pains were worse than the others. Others were more pronounced than the other. But we knew from the get-go that if we had to bring Liberia back to that place where our children could live in peace, where our bodies would not be exploited by young men, we had to put it together. We had to work together to make a difference. And so we launched something called the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. And in that mass action for peace, we did all kinds of activities, from sit-ins to prayer vigils to barricading halls to one day trying to withhold sex. And that was the one thing that took the storm <laughs> of the media. Because you see, in our world today, anything about the bodies of women, not our brains, but from here to here, makes headlines. So people wanted to know, this group of women, who are you, where do you, how can you, and blah, 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 blah. And I've often been asked, in a nation where almost 65% of the women were raped, how do you think, during a crisis, allegedly, how do you think withholding sex from men made a difference? And the response to that question is that when you're being raped, you're being forced. You're not giving it up willingly. When you decide, I am not giving it, even if you're forced into the process, there's absolutely no mental satisfaction from that person who's taking it from you because you did not give it willingly. 
I, I don't know if I'm making any sense to you all this morning, but people will say rape is rape, yes. But you forced me. I didn't give it to you. And we decided that we were not going to do that because we felt like men were sitting on the fence and they were not talking to their buddies and the, the war was just really very bad. And then, so one day we go to peace talks and they decide, oh, they will not, and we barricade the hall. And then I get the second question I always get. And they come to arrest me. Arrest me for obstructing justice. I'm working for peace. How am I obstructing justice when I'm just barricading a hall with people who have guns and AK-47s? And so I said to myself, if you're going to arrest me, I'll make it easy for you. I'll strip naked. And so then the security who came to hold me, I don't know what they were afraid of seeing underneath my dress. They left me. <laughs> so we come to a place where someone also asks, so in a nation where women were also raped, what made a difference when you said you were going to strip naked? First, in our culture, it's a curse for someone to disrobe in protest. The second thing is, one of the warlord response to that question was, we had done a lot, including raping women. But the question we all ask ourselves is, what have we done that will make our mothers deliberately, deliberately dishonor themselves. It's easy when you dishonor me. That's your thing. I did not dishonor myself. But in my sound mind, and that is the highest form of protest, that is the highest form of protesting where humanity has brought us. And it may not be disrobing by taking off your clothes, but I think the moment that we're all talking about the decade of women, the decade of girls, the decade of girl power, the decade of she empowers, and all of the different names, the decade of women march, I think this is the moment for all of us to get to that place where we disrobe. Disrobe in protest of all of the mass rapes that are happening. Disrobe in protest of the, 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 the divisions that have been created in our world to the point that even babies are now understanding race relations when it should not be. We should be protesting the politics that has engulfed our world to the point that we are voting leaders not to protect us, but leaders who are dividing us. And this is not just an American problem. So I think it's time for us to disrobe as women. And in disrobing, we're stepping out and saying to the world that we're putting out a kind of strength that you've never seen before. I like the idea of women who graduated from Columbia. If you look around, you see different faces, shapes, color, the not so old and the a little bit old and the <laughs> kind of old and the I'm not going to be old and, you know, everyone coming together. This is the spirit that we need in the world that we need today. We can stand up and talk about women's empowerment, girls' power, girls' rights. But until it is done collectively, like the Somalian women coming together and saying, yes, even though you, have, you are the fifth wife of an imam and I'm the second wife of a teacher and you are the third wife of someone else, but we make up a Klein, and we're stepping out to those leaders of our communities to say, this is the sixth Klein. And those women in Kenya are coming together and saying to the imams and everyone else, you know what, we know something, and you are going to listen to us. Our world is calling us to a place where we need to step out. We need to, and so, so people, the next question they will ask you is, how do I do that? Even if it means sitting in your house and writing poems to inspire someone, that's something to do. I walk around New York sometimes 
with a smile on my face and say, whoever will catch it will catch it. Because there are so many angry people walking around that sometimes the anger is just like a disease. You know, so sometimes I'm just smiling. And, 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 and so one day I was in the store and this woman looked at me and said, I just want to come and wipe that effing smile off your face. And I still smiled. <laughs> but from human rights violation, as bad as it is, to our interactions on a daily basis, these are things that we need to work on. How do we give a world to my 10-year-old and some grandchildren and babies unborn if we have all this negativity happening? One of the ways women have been described that I like, a group of women in, in Uganda once said, we are nurturers of our societies and sustainers of peace. And that is what we are. And so when, when there is this call that it's time for us to disrobe, we're not disrobing to dishonor ourselves. We are disrobing to solidify our role as nurturers of societies and sustainers of peace. Over the last few years, since winning the Nobel Peace Prize, I traveled from north to south. As a matter of fact, Wednesday, I came off a 14 hours flight from Abu Dhabi. And then I enter my house and there was no food. And then the reality of, okay, in this space, you are not a Nobel laureate, you're just mommy. Then I had to cook. And then I had an interview and the people came to do their podcast interview and I'm wearing this boo-boo. If you're African in this room, you know it's very shapeless and has no form. And then I have something on my head, and sometimes I take my underwear and make it for nightcap. So I'm wondering whether it's <laughs> one of those days that. And then we go to do the podcast. And afterwards, I have to do all of the things. But the beauty of the journey that I find myself in is that in little spaces and big spaces, you have women doing great things to bring their community closer back to what I like to describe as our collective humanity. Women coming together and saying, we're going to change this. I was recently in Cameroon where they've been fighting for the last three years, and no one wants to recognize that there's an active war happening in that country. And they have a group of women who have come together. And, and so where they're fighting the war, there's no school. So children have not been going to school for three years. And those educators who defy people and say, we'll send our children to school, they either get amputated or shot at. So it's such a horrible thing, but you never, you, it will be different. You, don't, you won't read it in New York Times or HuffPost or the Daily whatever, because it's just that place. But in that place, there are a group of women who decided we're going to start something called the Day of Lamentation. It's the day we cry. It's the day we disrobe to everyone to say, this is, where you, this is how far you've destroyed our community. So they, they actually go to the warring groups and negotiate with them and say, can you put your guns down today? And to the government, say, can you not send your soldiers out? We're taking over the streets because this is the day that we step in to moon the tragedy of our babies dying, our daughters being raped, we being defiled. This is the time that we do that. People ask me, don't you get depressed? Don't you get sick? Don't you get upset when you see these things? No, I don't. I get angry, but anger is that fuel that pushes me to go in. If all of you, I'm not talking about the angry that will say, I want to smack that effing smile off your face. No. The anger at the state of our humanity to the point that it moves you to action. Not the one that you just sit in, you know, but in 2000, when you all had the elections here after Obama left office and Trump became, when the women came out to march, 
that was disrobing. With the different slogans. And you see, the beauty of that march, even though someone would want to put it into a political context, even though it was spurred by an event, but that event was just the trigger of many events that happened prior to Trump. It had nothing to do with him. If anyone in this room think, okay, I went there because of Trump, maybe it's just you. But from my perspective as an African and as an activist who have traveled this country, that bearing of souls should have happened years ago. I go to places where I get questions. And sometimes I say, please, I don't want to answer it in this way because I don't want them to revoke my visa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but one of the questions that I got, I was in like the back of Indiana, like two days before the elections. And this little girl asked me, what do we do? if Trump wins. And I said, I can't tell you what to do, but what I can definitely tell you is to ask yourself, how do we hold our society together if Trump wins? How do we continue to teach our children as mothers that we have a collective humanity. Republicans, Democrats, white, black, influential, non-influential, Christian, Muslim, hip, not so hip, slim, fat, gym going, home staying, eating all day like myself. That we all have one thing in common. Not only do we inhabit this, that we live, inhabit this space called the US, but if you cut that sister and this sister, what comes out is red blood. And because of that collective humanity, we are bind or binded together. We, we, we are bound together to, 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 to keep our communities going. Someone will say, isn't that a lot of pressure? So what about the men? If you want to tweet, Sustainers of society and nurturers of peace. If you want to claim that title, then there should be no question about what about the men. And the reason why I'm spending my time on the relationship here is because I've been privileged to be in spaces in this country that some of you have been privileged to go into. But when you sit with young people, there is a feeling of being lost because the divisions is taking a toll. A toll on young people trying to understand who are we? And it's just not an America's problem. Everywhere. And everywhere, the rhetorics from every side of the aisle is let's divide even further. And the response to that rhetoric or those rhetorics is for all of us to disrobe and resist the divisions of our nation and our people. So in 2012, after I won the prize, I went to Cape Town and I met a professor from here, Peter Coleman, we started talking. He said, what? what Yes, you've won the prize. What other? You see, it's easier to win the prize when you're 69 or 79 or 89. Then you can say, this caps off my career. I can retire in peace and retire my jersey. But when you're 39, people come back to you and say, what next? So it's like winning the prize is one chapter. And there's a second chapter that you have to follow. And one of the things that often troubled me was how in academia, there was this serious disconnect with activism. 
So professors go into the field and they interview people like myself. And they come back and write big books. But what I become in that writing is a subject. And what the professor becomes after writing is the expert. Am I making any sense to you all? So then I feel like, no, I'm an expert too. And I should be recognized as, as such. I built peace in my community. I knew where the weapons were. I interacted with the boy soldiers. All you did was took my words and put it into very nice languages and bind it. Yes, you're an expert in binding my words and putting them together. <laughs> but I'm an expert in doing the actual work. <laughs> so I said, I want to start a program. And it took us five years to research and do this and do that. And three years ago, the WPS program was born at the Earth Institute. And since we started this program, I've seen and heard firsthand how these women interacting with interns, grad students, and undergrad students is making a huge difference. But one of the goals of doing that program is to really shift the entire conversation of peace and security that leaves even those of us who call ourselves the experts out of the discourse. Because the whole concept of peace and security is militarism. So if you decide to disrobe because you've been dishonored, and there's a conversation about why women are suffering, why they're disrobing, you do not become someone who's competent enough to have to be a part of that conversation because they position the entire conversation in a way that is about men with guns. Am I making any sense? Am I losing people here? Tell me if I am, because. So our intentions was to say, when your sons are killed, That's peace and security. Housing, lack of housing, is peace and security. Rape. So it was about take, changing the whole narrative around peace and security that is so focused on guns and men and bringing in our human security needs. The need for freedom of speech, the need for rights. And if you look around the whole concept of human security needs, who are those individuals that are impacted the most on the lack of women? So that's the first thing we, we decided to do. The second thing I talked about earlier was positioning these women as experts and not subjects. And the third thing was having literatures. Because everything you see in the film, I mean in the field, are folklores, stories by the fireside. And then people ask you, did it really happen? Yes, they did. Maybe you get someone call and Abby Disney come and do a film and then everyone, oh, that really happened. But in the world that we live in, especially in this country, if it didn't show up in New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, then it did not happen. And so what we're trying to do is to bring that kind of together. But the most important thing is to bridge the gap that has been created amongst us on the basis of titles and all of the different things. You see, sisters, if we must bear our soul in this robe, we have to do it in unison. We cannot bear our souls in this robe at the state of our world when in this room there is a huge gap. And so we're trying with that program to bring activists with sisters in academia to say, let's sit down and find a common ground so that when we decide to disrobe, 
it can be super. So this year, we just came back from Nairobi, where we had our second cohort of women. So we brought a group from Lesotho. They do sexual rights. And then we brought women from the Boko Haram area of Nigeria. So of course, the basic stereotype is that you can't put these hardcore Muslim women in a room with gay girls. There's going to be fire. After four days of interacting, a girl from Lesotho Wall stood up and said, this is the first time I've been in a room with people from different religious groups where they've treated me like human. This is the first time that I did not have to try to apologize for my sexuality. This is the first time that my humanity was not linked to my sexuality, even though they are the same, but people did not interact with me on the basis of. And this is where we need to come. Because we can talk about climate justice and all of the different things that are impacting our world and the need to empower women with money and all of these different things. But until we pull it together, this rope, and confront the world, we can never really make that change. Because the change that our world requires, requires me looping arms with you, and you looping arms with her, and she looping arms with the other, and the other, and the other, and the other, and then we stand up with our feet firmly planted on the ground, and together shout, never again. Not on our watch, where our sons be killed, not on our watch where we allow all of these divisions based on the skin of the color of our skin, not on our watch where we do this and do that and do the other. Because you see, for us in Liberia, until we understood that concept, we could not see peace. When we came into that room to have a discussion about disrobing, we knew very well from the get-go that we could only disrobe if we came together. And the first question we asked ourselves, does the bullet know a Christian from a Muslim? Can the bullet pick and choose? When a Muslim woman lost her son, and all daughter, the pain that she feels here, is it different from the pain that the Christian woman will feel when she also loses her child? And the answer in that moment was a resounding no. And because we knew that we had shared bounds, shared experiences, shared sufferings, shared pains, whether you like it or not, in this country, in this room, regardless of your social economic status, each and every woman in this room, if she made a list of 10 pains, and another sister from another race made a list of 10 pains, check it out, there will be one similar pain that you share across race. And that, for me, is what should bind us rather than divide us. For us to open doors, walk in, and not have a slam behind us so that the next person coming cannot come in, we must pull it together. This morning, let us disrobe, not because we want to show our bodies, but we're disrobing because we share similar humanity. And because of our collective humanity, the world is crying out to us, come together and save me. Thank you.
Welcome. Um, so now we're going to be taking questions and answers from this inspiring talk. If you have a question, please just find a mic. They're stationed at different places. You can see people. And before you ask your question, please state your full name and school. Yes, could you please stand? Yes, good morning. Thank you, that was so inspiring. Um, Judy Farrell, School of International and Public Affairs, class of 96. My question is, um, I'm smiling, but in 2016, the morning after the election, I was not smiling in the United States. Um, and I guess the question I have for you is, what startled me the most was how many women voted for the other candidate when there was the first female candidate on the presidential ticket. And it cut across socioeconomic, education, race. I mean, just, you know, there were so, I, that stunned me, the number of women that did not support that candidate. So did you have any observations or feelings about that? Yeah, I, I think one of the things we need to understand is that it has nothing to do with someone wanting to be bad. We've been socialized to check ourselves more than we've been socialized to check men. When we are um, in women stepping into the public sphere, growing up as a girl, you know that around the table conversation, what the hell is she thinking? That is not supposed to be. It's for men. The generation of women in this room and the generation of women who did not vote for Hillary are the generation of women who were socialized to believe that she should sit down. Her husband has been president before. What the hell is she looking for? When we are looking at leaders, no one, looks, no one is looking at, say, President Trump or President We are in Liberia no one is asking about how many girlfriends or, boy, uh, or women they've slept with. Once a woman steps into that sphere and says she wants to be, we will do analysis from her nail polish up to her hair. And if it doesn't align with the way we think or have been socialized to believe a leader should look, it's a turn off. No, you barely ever find people looking beyond their personal feelings of a woman wanting to run for office to her level of competency. It's always the personal first and every other thing later. And so I feel like that moment, because I'm an internal optimist, whilst other people were crying and mourning, I happened to be in New York. I had something to do, and every one of my feminist sisters from the Gloria Steinem to Abby Disney said, you don't want to miss the celebration. And I said, okay, I'll stay one more day. But even though we didn't get the glass ceiling to fall on us as we anticipated after her win, I used that opportunity to write letters to every young girl that I know reinforcing the need for us to sh come together under our shared feminist values to change the world. And this is the essence of probably what I'm talking about this morning. It doesn't only mean that we should vote for this person, but how are we supporting other women in their quest for even transforming communities and doing different things and doing the other thing? It is that spirit that if we generate can lead us into electing that first woman. In Liberia, I, I, I'm, I was never a fan of President Sirleaf. But when it got to the place where it was President Sirleaf and George Weah in 2005, we told ourselves, let's take this chance. This is the moment. If we don't do it now, we will never see it. So we started mobilizing for her on the basis of our common humanity as women. And we were able to break history by electing Africa's first female president. It had nothing to do with her intellectual ability. 
I'm being very honest here. No one was looking at, she's a Harvard grad. She worked with the World Bank. It came to the place where it was a woman and a man, and we're taking this woman for this moment because we work hard for peace. This is the icing on our cake. We'll vote for her. And that's what we did. Until we get to that place where we stop looking at her hair color, the way she smiles, the way, and look at what, first, what binds us together. And then second, what she's able to produce. Please, we will continue to say we almost, and I think there's this song that Brandy made that says almost doesn't count. Next question. Over here. Ms. Bowie, it's so nice to see you. I'm Gracie Stoddard. I'm a graduate of the uh, Columbia School of Social Work, and I've met you before some years ago because I uh, serve a foundation, the African Dream Academy Foundation in Monrovia. And uh, I, first of all, I completely agree with you that the first step is, is definitely to combine arms to stand up for other women and to have this solidarity. But knowing a little bit about your history and the history of Liberia, uh, one story I remember is how you got the young men and the boys to drop their weapons. You actually were so practical. You just turned to the UN and say, well, you know, if we pay them, they'll, give it, they'll put down their guns. And they did. And that's how you helped us stop the war. So I guess my question is, we, we're going to come together as a group because that's where the power is for the humanity. Do you have anything to say about how we can have the other half of our world, the men, understand the power that we have without uh, putting up the barricades to, to put arms together to bring them in on our humanity? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, you know, I'm a radical. I'm, I'm a radical, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to be making that confession, but because, and probably because I grew up in a home of five sisters, and a grandmother who is a feminist, and a mother who is a no-nonsense person, I don't know how to wait for a man to accept my strength. I go to meetings and I know that if a man, an educated man, was walking in that room, he will walk, fix his jacket, and come in with everything that he gets, has. So when I'm walking in that room, whether it's my hair tie, I tie it in a way that I'm going to intimidate some brothers. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are almost the same number, even more than the men. Why I am respectful of what they bring? Why should it always be the women who's trying to bring them along? Have you seen the way politics are done? Women for Obama, women for Trump, women, they need us. And until we get to that place where in politics, in business, and all, in corporate America you have the top 10 CEOs or the top 100 CEOs being predominantly men, right? But if you go down the bottom of all of those companies, you see that the base of a vast majority of those companies are women. So it means they are the foundation, the strength with which these men are able to show their power. At the community levels, it's the same way. So maybe our generation has allowed this to happen. I don't think it is the moment for us to keep saying, how do we, how do we? I don't want my daughter to wait. I, I know she's intelligent. I took this baby to meet with Oprah one day, and we're sitting at Oprah's dining table, and I said 10 things to Oprah, and they started talking, and the next thing, Oprah said, Lema, let's go see my property. Of course, I assume I am the Nobel laureate, so I reached for 
the front seat of her golf cart and she goes, no, 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 I want more to sit with me in the front seat. I was like, Jesus. <laughs> in one hour, I became the tag along and she became the guest. <laughs> Before we left, she pulled me aside and said, this girl is so smart. She is so sharp. Please, 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 whatever it is you've done, don't stop. Because she will be a force of nature. Should I now say, okay, as you are moving forward and there's this brother standing in front of you, you have to say, sir, please let me pass. No, baby girl, Walk past him. If your breeze can knock him out, knock him out. And someone will say, well, for the way the real world works, it's not, maybe you are living in a fantasy world, but ask every woman in this room who has done great things. She didn't wait for anyone to give it to her. She wasn't apologetic about her success. I've taught courses and classes in many of the universities in this country. And one of the things I say to the young women, let me tell you something, even if you play dumb because you want to date, dumb will always be dumb. Because your dumb will be too smart for that boy. So if you are strong and you try to be weak, even in your weakness, you'll still be strong. In Liberia, during the peace process, we used to, first time we saw the warlords, we knelt down. Sir, please, give us peace. And this one man was like, as we're kneeling there, okay, I like the way you all are kneeling, just as the position will take you all in and have babies by you. Hey, I stood up and said to the women, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. We will no longer, and he said, oh, you people are not kneeling. We won't give you peace. I said, never will I, will I kneel for idiots like you. And he was looking. I said, we will never kneel. We went back into the room and said, we said to the women, it's time for us to find our power. The speaker of our parliament came one day and said, who is the person that brought these women out here? I want to see the person. I walk up to him and say, I'm the one. Why, why, why? And I was in his face. Unfortunately for him, he was this tall. <laughs> and then when the women knew that I had gotten so angry because I was ready to tear him up, some of them came and stood between us. I refuse, ma'am to move in this space and tell my daughters and the girls that we should allow them to bring us along. It is in this attitude of allowing them to bring us along that we are, we are the smartest. Yes, they are smart men. I don't want the men in this room to leave and tweet that they've seen the most arrogant African woman even to have been called that. <laughs> But trust me, for those who have daughters, you will know that these girls should not be waiting for anyone to give their place in society or give them places in society. If you believe in a higher power, for us we say God or Jesus who created this world, he did not create it for it to be in this form. I was just in Saudi Arabia making a presentation on women's rights to so some of the crown prince and princesses. And the one thing I asked them to do at the end of my presentation that I will ask all of us, cover your one eye and try to see the full picture of this room. It's not possible. You will miss some things on your left or on your right depending on which eye you've covered. This is how our world is functioning in with the absence of women in different sphere. We can't see the full picture with one gender dominating and it's not about asking, can we? The sensible thing is to let go. One civil society leader told me the meaning of empowerment. And for us, the women in the room, this applies to us too. Say, 
for you to say, I have empowered someone, you must be able to give up some of your power. This one in the back. Over here. Yes, please. My name is Jayla Alston. Um, I'm a sophomore in Columbia College, and I also recently had a birthday, which is shared with my mother. Um, I turned 19, and <laughs> <laughs> since since being at Columbia, I've I've learned quite a few lessons, but I feel like recently it's kind of dawned on me that some of the most important ones were ones that I learned at home. And I wanted to ask you what you feel like is a very important lesson that you've learned from your own mother that you've carried with you throughout your activism in your adult life. My grandmother, I would say, was a feminist. She taught us one on one, is a <laughs> feminist. We had, we we're five sisters and we had um, four, four cousins who were all boys. And if you ever went to Ma in the day, because she used to look after us and say, oh, this person punched me. She would look at you and say, do you have a brother to go and fight for you? No, go back and fight for yourself. So that was the first thing. The second thing she would do is every December, she would come and give us coins. It took a long hours, very slow growing up. It took a long time for me to catch up that the coins was for us to invest. So she would give coins, and the following December, she would say, I gave you a dollar last Christmas. What did you do with it? And my siblings would come, oh, I started making candy and see what I got in my cash box. And I would have been the bum for the day. My friends would be walking behind me and fanning me, and I would have candy and kue all through the day and be broke by the evening time. <laughs> but by the time I was coming, to becoming a, coming into my teenage years, I realized first that fight, go and fight for yourself. And the coins, what she was teaching us was the lesson of dominating our own space. That if you don't take control of your space, this is my space right now. And if she comes up here and says, move, and I, I have not learned to dominate this space, I'll probably just get up and she can manipulate me any way that the purpose for me being in this space will never be accomplished. So I feel like from go fight for yourself to economic empowerment, she was saying, I need you. And one word she often said, because rice is a staple in our country, she will always say, girls, if your husband bring the rice, be able to bring the charcoal to cook the rice. So that was my upbringing. That was the, the, the lessons that I heard, that you have to be a strong woman. You have to control your space. If, you have, if you're lucky to have a husband, you have to be able to be his partner, not the person that he will be lording over or anything like that. So that, that was the lesson that I learned from that old lady in. My mother really is, is, is the same as my grandmother. And what we observed was my father had more education than my mother. But my father died without any property. Because everything they owned, she bought it. He used to say that his life was about eat, drink, send children to school, and when he died, he would have no regrets. And she was about, I'm buying land, I'm building houses, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So there is not a single deed or legal document for any property that my parents own that you find my father's name on. He owned nothing. So it was that upbringing from her mother that she brought into her life, and we were fortunate to have that grandmother pass on that same kind of upbringing to us. And as a matter of fact, when you are able to learn as a child that you must dominate your space, you have a set values for your life that even if you go left or right and things go bad, you still find yourself coming out because those values have been implanted deep within you and you will find it to get out of whatever life situation. So don't take what she said for granted, did for granted, because regardless of
how many degrees you get from Columbia, when you step into the University of Life, those things at home, Columbia degree cannot help you with. Got a question in the back? Oh, okay. This one here. Hi, my name is Megan Marsh, and I'm an SPS alum. Uh, my question for you, so in a world riddled by complexity and with the distractions, obligations of daily life, it can be very easy to feel disempowered and to think these problems are so much bigger than me. How can I personally have an impact? And I'm wondering, in a situation of armed conflict, where did you find that personal agency and what ignited that fire to make you think, I actually have a voice and I'm the person who can make a difference? Well, the, the, one of the ways that I like to, to do this, I, I try to illustrate when I'm talking to young people about that question of the, uh, the, the, the huge global challenges we face. What I do is, in your minds, I just try to picture a big ball of problems. It's whole when we look at it in our mind's eye. And then you have all of us in this room surrounding that big ball of problem. And each of us have a chisel. And you are, if I may ask you, what is that thing that keeps you awake at night? What is your, yes. <laughs> Work stress. So. If you say, I'm going to put this into a context of the global problems we have, stress is a global problem. And because I'm impacted by it, I'm passionate about it, I want to work to end it. That's what you are chasing at in this huge problem. Once you are able to take out a tiny piece, if you look at that ball of problem that was whole, you realize that it's not whole anymore because any substance that have a tiny piece taken out of it is not a whole problem anymore. And that's how I see my role in this world. I may not be able to finish the global crisis of conflict or women empowerment, but when I'm able to chisel a tiny bit out, I've made one small space in this world better than where I met it. So if all of us in this room see the way we do activism, our professional life, for everything towards the greater good of humanity as, I may just do this tiny bit, and that tiny bit is going to, you know, move on to be something or do something, you've done your part. So uh, in, in, in my third life, which is after the Nobel, I started sending children to school. And I met this little girl once, and she said, I know that education is my future. I know that I want to do this. I know that I want to do all of that. But my parents are poor. My father is a drunk. And blah, 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 blah. She went on. So of course, if I find an older man who wants to sleep with me and pay my fees, I will do it because I want to go to school. And then I said to her, there's always another way. Selling your body is not always the only way. There's always another way. I said it and moved on. One day she texted me and said, I, I was at the peak of finishing my degree, uh, my first degree, and I didn't have my school fees. And every time I tried to go to this person who I knew if I went to would give me money after sex, I kept hearing there's always another way. And so I started to look for part-time jobs. Long story short, I found it. I pay my fees, and I finished. Thank you for that lesson of there is always another way. I sent her, after she got her first degree, we got a scholarship, she came here to the US, did her master's, and she's doing her second master's now. But there's always another way. So I feel like that story tells me that I was able to break off of the global problem. So let's see it that way, that we are just taking our tiny pieces bit by bit, bit by bit. If all of us do that, when we step back and look at it, maybe a huge chunk of it has come out, and the next generation will come and chase her away 
in the next generation. We may not see an impact in our lifetime, but something like that. Your other question was about hope, right? Where did I get the... I have a very strong faith in God, and, and my faith is everything to me. So sometimes, yes, I want to give up, but I, I feel like because I'm very deliberate about what I do, I always look for little signs here and there to say, this is the way to go. It may be a text message, or it may be a letter. I came very close to giving up um, on this work that I used to do. And then one day I'm going to, I'm in Luxembourg, and I'm supposed to give a speech on girls' education, but some political things had happened that I was being blamed for that was weighing very heavily on me. And I kept asking myself, why the hell do I want to be in a field that I'm helping people and they're not appreciative because I made it about me in that moment. And so I get to Luxembourg and I'm totally like disoriented. It's 10 minutes for me to go into parliament to deliver this much anticipated address on girls' education and I have nothing in my brain. And then my phone beeps and I open it up and it's a text message from a little girl. I said, don't ever, ever give up. People like you give people like me a reason to hope for a brighter future. That was all I needed. In the midst of tears and everything coming down, I knew what I wanted to say to the House of Parliament in Luxembourg. And so those tiny signs, if you are one of those people who's always looking for the negativity in life, you never get it. I'm always looking for bright signs. I, I know there are one or two more questions. Time for one more. So we'll take that one there. Um, my name is Emma Rimmerman. I'm actually a junior in high school still, but my mom, Claudia Kraut, um, is Columbia College, class of 88. Um, and I know you, um, you called yourself a feminist and you called your mother and grandmother feminists. And I think that's really wonderful, and I know a lot of women who exemplify feminist ideals, yet they're afraid to actually call themselves a feminist. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and why you think that is. I don't know about them, but in my radical mind, baby, if you feel you are a rose, and if everyone else in the room is afraid to say that they are roses, and you know you're sitting in a room with a bunch of roses, be that person who say, I'm a rose. And eventually you inspire one other person to say, so when I started, uh, I claimed feminism as my politics. I was in a nation where no one wanted to talk. So someone says they knew two women in Liberia who would publicly say, I'm a feminist. My mentor at Twitter, Cooper, and myself. Today, 25 years later, every young girl is calling herself a feminist, even if they're making fun of them. So I think as a young person, the lesson to you is always go with your guts. Let me tell you something that I say to young people. When you go on the internet right now, whether it's Yahoo or Gmail, there is one corner there that they say trending, right? Mm? Yeah. But trending never lasts. So if you go to trending, you see in three minutes, something else has overtaken the first thing that was trending, something else, something else, something else. Don't ever follow trend. Be yourself, girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Let me take that last one. Okay. We still have one minute. We've got a minute. Now, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, all. Um, my name is Cynthia Moreno. I'm actually a current student at the School of Social Work. Um, so in May, there will be a graduating class of social workers. So my question is, and something that I could share back, is what would your message be? to them as they step out into the world um, and having been part of the School of Social Work? And then second, would you ever consider speaking to us at the School of Social Work? <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, there's someone in this room called Michaela, and she could probably make it happen, but it would be passing through four other people to see if they can clear me for her to clear me to come and clear you. <laughs> so yes, there's a possibility. Um, the, the, the question about leaving social work school, when I did social work, 
the first thing I knew as a social worker is that there are certain things in the field of social work that I could not do. And so as a social worker, always know your tolerance level. I know that orphanages are not my thing. Not because I hate children, but because of the way the institutions treat children is disempowering for me. So as a social worker, always look for that thing that refills your energy and not the thing that takes energy away from you. Anything women's rights got me going is that anger that I carry, but the anger is the fuel that I need to do the work that I do. So please, as you go out and I see your recording, share with your class, step into the world, even if there's gonna be a lot of money in the first day you walk in that room and you can't think and you can't walk and you can't feel and all you want to do is to sit down and cry, run, because you'll be so ineffective in that place. Find that place that gives you joy and happiness that every morning you walk into, you look forward to just interacting with people. That is my message to every social worker. Find your tolerance level. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, Rema. That was so inspiring. And I think I speak from, for everyone when I say, you touched our brain, you touched our heart, and you touched our soul with everything you had to say today. Thank you. Thank you.